Welcome everyone to this ASAP Bio and KFG webinar on rapid communication uh, of COVID-19 research. We are grateful to be joined by three wonderful panelists today uh, to discuss the various ways in which they and their organizations are uh, having conversations about research. Uh, this webinar is being co-produced uh, uh, by the Knowledge Futures Group which builds technology for the production, curation, and preservation of knowledge and service of the public good. Uh, ASAP Bio, we are a scientist-driven nonprofit working to promote innovation and transparency in life sciences communication. Um, I'd now like to invite one of our ASAP Bio board members, Richard Wilder, who is also the general counsel and director of business development at Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, to say a few words about the importance of rapid research sharing in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you very much, Jessica. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm, I'm proud to be a board member of ASAP Bio. You know, I think it's an organization that, uh, in, in the promotion of, of, um, of uh, preprints, you know, is, is an organization that has really uh, pushed a lot in order to ensure that the output and, and uh, out, out, yeah, output from scientific research is rapidly disseminated. And yes, it's very important with respect to the response to COVID-19. I think we've all seen uh, as this virus emerged and as it uh, spread across the planet that it has moved very rapidly. Um, it has uh, moved in a way I think sometimes that gets ahead of, of our uh, you know, public authorities and resources to be able to deal with it. Um, and you know, for us that are involved in research and development activities to come up with interventions to stop it or to slow it, uh, being fast, you know, to be able to come up with those uh, interventions uh, is, is critical. We need to be able to match the speed of, of the virus that we're trying to deal with. And so from CEPI's perspective, the Coalition for Epidemic Pre Preparedness Innovations, uh, we have a, a mantra that we use of pursuing speed, scale, and access. Uh, we're an organization that was established uh, about three years ago now uh, and announced um, at the World Economic Forum, the purpose of which uh, was to rapidly develop vaccines against a number of infectious diseases that have epidemic potential, as well as building out platforms that can be used to uh, much more rapidly develop and bring into existence vaccines. Um, our Target was uh, 16 weeks from the identification of a, uh, a, a, new, um, a new pathogen to having a vaccine that's in the clinic, beginning clinical trials. And with respect to COVID-19, we've been able to achieve that and even uh, beat that time frame. Um, one of the things that is essential to be able to, to be successful if you have a, a scientific undertaking for which speed is of the essence is to be open, transparent, uh, about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, one of the things that um, we have benefited from uh, in responding to the, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is the openness and transparency of those that are developing uh, sequences, gene sequences for the pathogen itself. You know, originally coming out of, of China uh, and being you know, published in, in an open uh, format, uh, both in terms of the technology that's used as well as what people are enabled to do uh, with those gene sequences. Mm -hmm. uh, so one could then download them, make use of them to begin the process of developing vaccines, um, developing uh, drugs, developing diagnostics and so on. And so openness with respect to access and broadness in terms of permission as to what you can do with that data, with that information is extremely important. Um, and as we stand up our projects, as we have done since we were founded three years ago and what we've been doing with respect to COVID-19, as I mentioned, access is very important. And when we think about access, um, you know, what comes first to mind, of course, is access to the, the, the vaccines once developed. Uh, we are intended to be an organization that is developing vaccines that will be uh, accessible, um, available and accessible where they're needed most to uh, address outbreaks to address epidemics, and now in this case, address pandemics. Um, and so access to the vaccine itself, uh, in terms of ensuring that we achieve the scale necessary to address the problem and methods of distribution uh, is, is very important as well. So in that connection, making sure that we have you know, full buy-in to what we need to do 
in terms of ensuring access requires openness and transparency on our part in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we're setting up our arrangements and so on. Uh, it also requires openness and transparency, not only amongst the developers that, that we're funding. We have eight and probably in, in the not too, well, in the next a couple of weeks, let's say we'll have 10 uh, projects up and running for the development of vaccines against uh, the, uh, the virus, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. Um, and so we'll have uh, you know, up to 10 projects up and running. And uh, all of those projects, uh, we do require openness with respect to the data that's generated, including clinical trial data, um, openness with respect to, to the publications, uh, and speed, you know, including preprints to ensure that uh, the results of the work that is being undertaken using our funding is disseminated broadly. Uh, as we see it sort of kind of close to home for the benefit of those projects that we're funding, but there's also a number of other projects that are developing uh, vaccines um, against the virus, uh, developing um, uh, therapeutics against the virus, diagnostics and so forth, for which that same information, that same body of information would be important you know, to be able to move forward. And if we're going to be successful in our goal of uh, developing a vaccine within 12 to 18 months of that you know, original identification of a pathogen, um, being able to do so uh, in parallel rapidly is going to require that um, everyone that we're working with has you know, full and fair uh, access uh, to the data that's, that's being generated and information that's being uh, generated. Um, just the, the last thing I'd say in, in closing, just as a point of comparison, is that uh, histori historically, you know, the vaccine development work um, has run to six years to 10 years uh, to develop a vaccine because you, know, you do things in the, the normal course, and we're not cutting corners in, in what we do, but what we're doing is, is a lot of work uh, at risk, um, where we're doing things in parallel that you would normally do in sequence. Um, and in order for us to be uh, successful in you know, meeting the requirements of speed, scale, and access, you know, I think uh, openness and the ability of, of uh, all the institutions that are involved to broadly share information, and not just about the development, of vaccines and the projects themselves and what comes out of them, but what's happening on the ground in terms of epidemiology, um, what's happening with respect to different policy positions and how they're being implemented around regulatory approvals and so forth, you know, need to be broadly, rapidly, and, and preferably in real time uh, communicated out to uh, this, this community that we're all part of as we're you know, addressing the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. So with that, Jessica, I'll, I'll stop you know, my introduction, and I know there's an opportunity for questions as we go along, but uh, look forward to, you know, to the rest of the discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dick. I just want to introduce also my colleagues, Victoria Yan and Catherine Ahern, who's here from the Knowledge Futures Group, who will be helping with uh, asking questions as well. So I just want to turn the floor over to Victoria now, who will introduce our panelists. Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. And uh, just a reminder for everybody that uh, this uh, will be recorded. And uh, first, we'll have the panelists uh, speak. And following that, we will have the Q&A session. And to join that later on, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and unmute your own video. And first, we will have uh, our speaker uh, sharing the researcher's perspective. We have David O'Connor from the Department of Pathology at University of Wisconsin. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and your research on COVID-19 and how this particular research community is community, uh, communicating their research during the current situation. Sure, thank you, Victoria, and thank you to everyone who's listening in. Uh, as Victoria said, my name is Dave O'Connor. I run a research group here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and we have been involved in a large uh, collaboratory that we've helped set up called the COVID, uh, which began back in the middle of January when we recognized that this was likely going to be a significant uh, threat that was going to require significant collaboration between different types of stakeholders in order to do the best sort of research possible. And my lab works on a couple of different things. First, we do animal model work. And animal models are really um, important because we can control the dose and the timing and the strain that we use. 
and we can follow animals longitudinally over time, but they're also restricted access, meaning you need specific sorts of facilities in order to conduct these studies, and there aren't that many of them. And what that means is that it is a sort of uh, a, both a privilege and an exclusive privilege in order to be able to uh, do this sort of work. And so if we're gonna design a study, we wanna make sure we can get as much out of that study as possible. And uh, to do that, you need a lot of different people with different opinions and different viewpoints. And so we started assembling a group of people who work either in animal models or clinicians or uh, in different types of research from cell biology to transcriptomics to neurobiology to aerobiology, the study of aerosols, um, and, 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 and many, many more uh, to think about how we should be designing studies uh, collaboratively to get the most out of them. And we focused most of our attention on non-human primate and ferret studies so far, um, but we've now have um, upwards of 100 people participating regularly in our calls and in our discussions. To do this, we initially used Slack as our uh, discussion uh, forum, and that has some real advantages. It's fast, it's easy, most people know how to do work with it right now, but I'll tell you the downsides to Slack as we currently use it are that it's not visible on the open web, and that actually bothers me because I worry that five or ten years from now, a lot of these uh, discussions won't be fully captured in, uh, the, in, 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 in a public way. Um, I don't think we have a better alternative yet, but this is something uh, that has me concerned. We have twice weekly phone calls um, as part of this collaboratory, and that's been quite successful at um, bringing people to the table. Even if they can't make every call, they can try to join in when it, when it makes sense. Um, and we've been able to start some of our studies and then we follow doing what we did back in 2016 when the Zika virus outbreak emerged, which is that we're sharing our data from our non-human primate studies in near real time at openresearch.labkey.com. So that means that we're putting raw data sets in Excel format, we're putting full summaries of our experiments, we're putting um, the, the, a, a narrative about what we're learning as we learn it and making that available because especially in non-human primate work, it's important not only to know what's going well, but it's also important to know what's not going well because this is an exclusive inexpensive and uh, ethically uh, 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 challenging uh, space to be in, we wanna make sure that if we make mistakes that no one else goes and repeats those mistakes. And the best way to do that is to make as much of that information available as quickly as possible. So um, that's one arm of what we're doing. The other arm is that we are involved in this sequencing of viruses. And that itself is also a, um, an interesting space um, because as many of you undoubtedly are aware, uh, there has been um, a real effort initiated in influenza uh, surveillance uh, to make global sequences of viruses available. And certainly um, the SARS-CoV-2 has benefited from that experience and the infrastructure that existed for, uh, for flu. Um, the challenge with that is that when you look at something like Nextrain, you see a, a huge heterogeneity in terms of sampling coverage and where this data is available from. Uh, so you have small academic labs like mine uh, contributing data alongside uh, public health departments, which on one hand is a great example of grassroots collaboration, um, but it also suggests that possibly um, this should be something that has a little bit more structure to it. So for example, we believe right now that there is a significant outbreak going on uh, in many US uh, cities, including New Orleans, and yet as of this morning, there were no sequences in uh, GIS aid uh, from Louisiana. So, you know, the, 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 the plus of self-aggregation is um, it's, it's great and it's grassroots and it's real time, but there are some real challenges in making sure that every uh, affected constituency gets represented because if, you know, you have an accident of geography where certain communities are really well represented, you can end up with decisions being made that aren't reflected of some of the, the, wider, uh, the wider constituencies that are also affected. And as someone who spends a lot of time on HIV issues, I'm particularly worried about what this means for, um, you know, uh, the surveillance and tracking in Sub-Saharan Africa and other resource poor settings where there isn't going to be as much uh, data that becomes available quite as quickly. Uh, so with that, I will stop and uh, reserve any other uh, comments for the question and answer period. Thank you. 
Thank you for sharing that. Uh, ne next, we have uh, Richard Tepper, who is a co-founder of the preprint server BioArchive and MedArchive, to tell us about how BioArchive and MedArchive is working with a large amount of preprints submitted on the SARS-CoV-2 situation. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. So just confirm that everyone can see that. Is that working for everyone, Jessica? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, uh, my name is Richard Sever. I'm co-founder of BioArchive and MedArchive uh, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, and um, uh, sorry, my screen is not moving on now. I have problems controlling the screen display for some reason. Okay, here we go. So yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about pre the preprints that we've been dealing with at BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, and just to be very clear by what I mean by a preprint, I mean early sharing of research um, before it goes through and is certified by the peer review process. This isn't kind of like a sort of post hoc archiving. This is the, you know, sort of hot off the printer papers, so to speak, um, written, written by scientists. Um, and we run two preprint servers, um, uh, BioArchive, which has um, been going for seven years now, focused on biological sciences, um, which has now got um, close to 80,000 papers, um, and a newer initiative, uh, MedArchive, which, you know, unfortunately, um, it was very timely in its launch last year. Um, it, it, it's a smaller server, but it's focused uh, mainly on the health serve, on the health sciences, clinical results and the, the key distinction here being that for clinical research there are additional concerns you have so we have um, enhanced screening and ethics procedures um, so the, I mean the background to, to, to why you would want to post a preprint is I think um, exemplified by this um, data provided by Stephen Royal which shows the, the the delay to dissemination that you get in the traditional publication process so the blue curve shows the submission to publication times of journals in um, in PubMed, and you can see the um, the median is about seven or eight months, and that range goes out to two to three years. Um, but you know, if you post on BioArchive, your paper can be read within um, 24 to 48 hours, typically. So that's a huge time saving to um, dissemination, and obviously the aspiration is that this translates to discovery. And Steve Quaker, the BioHub in San Francisco, has done some back of envelope calculations suggesting that if you can get everybody to post preprints, you could speed up um, scientific discovery fivefold in 10 years because you have the aggregate effect of all those um, time savings, um, which would sort of essentially have a geometric effect. Um, and obviously this is potentially far, far more important um, in a pandemic when you really want um, communication and discovery to happen as fast as you possibly can. Um, if you compare the 2003 SARS epi epidemic, 93% of the papers written about that epidemic appeared after the epidemic had ended. And you contrast that with um, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in 2020. And we just posted um, the thousandth preprint on um, BioArchive and MedArchive in the midst of the pandemic, which is a really um, uh, 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 incredible contrast to between SARS-1 and SARS-2. And these, these papers span the basic virology, um, the molecular biology of the virus, um, structural studies of the proteins involved, for example, to immunology, epidemiological studies, models of the R0, um, uh, public health. And, and you know, we're now beginning to see reports of, of drug trials. So it's the whole spectrum of um, academic research in this area. Um, this just shows what has happened since January across BioArchive and MedArchive, the, um, the lighter bars of the MedArchive posts and the darker bars of BioArchive. So you can see, um, you know, none until January. And then it's, we're getting probably, I mean, I was about, I normally say on average about 30 papers a day, but I think you can look at that distribution and say it's not one that makes sense to talk about on average. We yesterday posted a hundred papers in a day on MedArchive um, and a hundred papers is, about what we generally get across all fields in bioarchive, and yesterday we had a hundred in med archive on COVID nineteen alone. So it's quite it's quite striking the distribution of these papers, and and among them there's some very important work. Um, the couple just to highlight um, in basic biology, you see this 
um, paper that just came out uh, recently um, from Nevin Krogan and uh, Jamie Fraser and a, and a bunch of other people looking at the um, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, protein protein interactome, which is a very important paper that you know gives a lot of um, starting points for development of uh, new therapeutic targets. Meanwhile, on MedArchive, you see papers like this one, serological assay to detect um, seroconversion, which is obviously something that um, you know you want to have as fast as possible so that you can identify people who have had the virus and, and hopefully are, you know, have some immunity to it. Um, one of the things that has changed in the course of the pandemic is the amount of attention that these papers are getting beyond the normal readership. So this is just another example from MedArchive. This paper looked at the um, stability of the virus on different surfaces like cardboard, metal, et cetera. And you can see that this was picked up by more than 300 news outlets. And uh, these numbers are a little bit out of date, but the PDF alone has already been downloaded more than 600,000 times. These are not all scientists. So this is something to, 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 to think about. Um, and when we look at, this is the archivist, um, uh, uh, sort of a third party site that, um, that ranks papers by the number of times they've been downloaded. You can see the top 10 papers and bioarchive, um, all, all, all COVID-19 related papers. So that we're doing a few things um, uh, in, in the midst of this pandemic to sort of change the way we handle things slightly. One of the things we wanna do is um, increase discoverability. So we've created this, um, this summary page where you, where you only see the COVID-19 related preprints. Um, these are actually, uh, these are annotated by individuals in that they're, it, it, you know, they're early in, early in the pandemic, the word COVID-19 didn't exist. So, you know, these are actually, these are all COVID-19 papers, even before it was called COVID-19. So this isn't kind of, you know, this isn't a search result. This, this, this is manually, manually selected papers. Um, and then we, one of the things that you need to think about in the midst of the pandemic, again, is, you know, are there things that you should think about a little bit differently? Um, we have general criteria of bioarchive and metarchive, including, you know, obviously we don't want to post nonsense, pseudoscience, um, plagiarized work. Um, and the, but the cons it, it's a course filter. You may miss some things under the normal circumstances. This doesn't really matter. Does it matter when there's increased public attention on preprints? This is something we think about a lot. The do no harm considerations we've had from the inception of metarchive, like being cautious about dual use research, vaccine safety, um, disease transmission and toxicity claims. You know, we wouldn't want to post papers that said cigarettes don't cause cancer or that um, vaccines cause autism. But are there other things that we should be worried about in the course of a pandemic when there may be many more eyes and many more eyes from the general public on this? So, you know, we can talk about them. This may come up in the course of conversation, conspiracy theories. Is that something that if people willfully or accidentally misinterpret discoveries, is that something should we, we, we should be worried about? Drug availability. I think we've all seen what's happening with chloroquine. Um, I, would, um, uh, I, I suspect that the president suggesting that it's an um, effective cure is probably um, does more harm than, than med archive, a med archive paper saying that. But it is something that one needs to think about. So in light of some of these um, concerns, we have made some, some changes. Um, the, the declaration, we have enhanced declarations on bioarchive, which now make it much, much more clear that it's a, a preprint on what, what that is because of COVID-19, because members of the general public are looking at preprints more than they did, more than they did before. Um, we've enhanced our, we have a, on MedArchive, we've always had um, a, a very stringent screening process, but um, because of some of these concerns, we've introduced um, a dedicated COVID-19 workflow uh, bioarchive, so that COVID, any paper that's flagged as being COVID-19 goes through a dedicated group of screeners um, to who, 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 are, who, are, who are kind of thinking about these, um, these, these questions that we might have. And, and so there, there, there are a larger number of papers than normal that are returned to authors saying, you know, we, we think that this paper probably should go through peer review first um, in, in some cases. Um, one of the things we do want to do as well is to encourage preprint commenting. Um, this is the, the now infamous uncanny um, preprint about, um, about the virus, which, which 
led to a number of conspiracy theories, which I, you know, I, sh I should stress the authors were keen to point out that they were not themselves conspiracy theorists. And there may be some debate about that. But the interesting thing that happened because, of the, because it was a preprint was that within hours of the preprint being posted, there were many, many comments by renowned um, expert virologists around the world um, pointing out the flaws in this paper that we received 50 lengthy comments within one day. The authors then apologized for um, some of the um, inferences that they might have made people uh, make and the paper was formally withdrawn within two days. And so, you know, I mean, I think in many respects that that's an unprecedented, unprecedented speed of self-correction within the um, academic community. But it is, it is something to think about um, in terms of how we um, examine and, um, and, and peer review these papers. I mean, as well as encouraging commenting, we obviously want to link out to, as we do with all papers on bioarchive and metarchive, two discussions among scientists about these papers. So we, we have track that links to, to, um, to, to blogs, uh, preprint discussion sites, to uh, the Twitter conversations about the papers and things like TRIP, the new um, initiative that Eli from Review Commons uh, pursuing to review um, preprints uh, much, much faster than normally. Um, but I think it behoves us as a consequence of this to think about what peer review should look like in a pandemic. So this is a slide that I've taken from another talk that I gave where I talk about what the preprints move mean in terms of how we think about peer review, when we do it, which papers we do it, who does the peer review and when. And I think that's, you know, I think a pandemic does pose these questions um, and I think we really need to think about peer review and so uh, this is really the perfect time to sort of to hand over to, um, to Daniela because I think she's going to talk about one of the ways that we might do this. So thank you. Thank you so much Richard. So yes, this is a perfect segue to introduce our next speaker, uh, Daniela Sidiri, who is a co-founder of Pre-Review and also co-developed uh, outbreak Science, which is a platform with structured rapid peer review of outbreak-related preprints, which happened to very timely launch last December. So please tell us a little bit more about your work, Daniela. Sure. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can share my screen first. Nope, that's not the screen I want to share. <laughs> Apologies. It's similar. Oh, I want to, is this present mode? Is this how working right? This is, yes, we can see your screen. Uh, is it in presenter mode? There, uh, yeah. There's, a, yeah, there's a little bar at the top with the URL. No, that's it's not it the then. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is not showing well. <laughs> Just one minute, I'm going to present again. Here we go. Okay, it should work. Yeah. I guess it's the same with the URL. All right, <laughs> do this one. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting, for organizing this event first, and also for inviting me <coughs> to speak today, and Jessica and everybody else. And thank you to the audience for being here. Um, I'm Daniela Saderi, and I'm the co-founder and project director of Pre-Review. Pre-Review is an uh, open project that operates as a fiscal um, sponsor, as a nonprofit through fiscal sponsorship of uh, uh, Code for Science and Society. And in the past uh, year, year and a half, we have been collaborating with another nonprofit uh, called Outbreak Science to develop a tool to uh, allow for the rapid review of preprints in the context of an outbreak. Um, little did we know no, that when we launched, uh, we would have been in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but um, I also want to mention that uh, um, uh, Michael Johansson, the founder of Outbreak Science and our collaborator was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, he uh, couldn't make it, but I want to acknowledge also his contribution from the get go. Um, so before I start, and I should be able here. Uh, this is a URL to this presentation um, and whoever wants can follow along and click on the links uh, that are uh, throughout the slides. Just one minute to copy it. Um, okay, so full disclosure, I am not uh, an outbreak science in any way, scientist in any way. I am, my training was in neuroscience. 
But um, when I first met uh, Michael, who is actually a legitimate outbreak scientist, uh, he showed me some of the plots that kind of convinced me um, even more that what we were doing a pre-review where what we were going to do together was very uh, important. And so these are just uh, plots from the New York Times showing the um, number of new cases each week uh, of, through, throughout 2013 and 2015 of Ebola outbreaks in uh, three African countries. And if we align uh, the, to the same uh, time uh, frame, the number of publications, so the publications that came out um, as a response to the uh, Ebola outbreak, so Ebola related science, we can see that that is shifted in time. And this is something that uh, I'm stressing on more, but um, uh, Richard already covered. And so it presumably all this research has not really contributed to the response uh, to those uh, outbreaks, at least in the, when they happen in, in the peak of those outbreaks in those countries. And what Michael and collaborators also showed in, a, in an article um, that was, uh, was published during that time about the Zika and the Ebola outbreaks is that uh, the preprints that were posted uh, were actually out more than 100 days before the publication of the same uh, manuscript via uh, journal organized, that went through our journal organized peer review. And however, if we look at the number of preprints with respect to the number of uh, publications related to the, I think this was a combination of Zika virus and Ebola, but I'm not, not entirely sure. It was about less than 5%. So the what, what was happening is that we, you know, this the number also of preprints that came out, apologies, uh, were, were very slow, but nonetheless uh, were very um, early. What we're assisting uh, on today, and again, uh, Richard has, has shown this before, but the number of preprints related to this coronavirus pandemic is, um, is unprecedented. So this is a plot that um, kind of expands a little bit on the bioarchive and meta-archive preprints, but we see that from January 1st, um, or for January 13, every week we have an increased number of preprints that are posted online across different preprint servers with meta-archive being the um, the, uh, the has, having the biggest contribution. Uh, and so what this um, means is that we have this incredible amount of information that is coming out with the potential to really speed up science and discovery. Um, what drove us towards uh, building this tool, Outbreak Science Rapid Review, is that we wanted to provide an extra layer of um, uh, feedback that could be rapidly um, um, implemented during an outbreak by scientists who are very busy. And so when we were designing uh, this tool uh, starting last year, uh, we convened a group of researchers together and we were like, okay, so how can we come up with a structured review that um, they could provide a certain level of um, information and feedback uh, rapidly on a, in, in the midst of an outbreak? Uh, and so on rapid review, I'm sorry. Um, readers can uh, read the um, the reviews that others have made of um, uh, outbreak related preprints, and this is, in general, with that that said, because we launched in January, in January, most of the preprints that have been commented on are coronavirus related preprints. Um, the um, researchers themselves can fill out these rapid reviews. I'm going to show you them in a, in a minute. And they can also request feedback, which I think is a very interesting uh, feature that we would like to uh, bring more to uh, the usage of, uh, of, the, um, of other researchers so that we can see which one, uh, which one of these of this reprints as actually needs, um, might be in need of more revision. So this is a screenshot of the platform and uh, we have ORCID IDs um, related logins, so researchers with ORCID ID can uh, log in and uh, can request or review themselves uh, preprints by copying and pasting a DOI or an arch archive ID um, from a, a preprint of interest, and this is uh, covered several preprint servers. And we have a search bar that can allow uh, the user to search through the content of the platform, which would be preprints that have already been either requested for a review or have been reviewed themselves. And uh, infectious disease tagging, including the uh, coronavirus, um, the 2019 uh, coronavirus. Uh, the review itself displays on 
on top of the uh, preprint itself. And uh, it's a series of 11 structured questions with two or um, optional um, kind of uh, open-ended questions. And the combined reviews of different authors, in this case three, uh, can be displayed in this visualization that we're trying to like work on to make it easier. But the idea is that uh, it could provide a quick uh, look uh, a quick kind of like understanding to the feedback aggregated across different researchers and different reviewers. The, um, the, this works both in the website but also in the context of the preprint servers themselves if the user installs the uh, available extension for Chrome and Firefox. Um, so while they are surfacing uh, the, or reading through different preprints on Madarchi, for instance, or any other preprint server, they might see the number of requests that the preprint has received, the number of reviews, and open uh, the window themselves to review or request a review. Uh, we have a public and open API that we're hoping that other um, uh, websites that are you know, other stakeholders uh, can um, use. Uh, with our collaborations to integrate this, um, uh, this tool such that it doesn't require um, an installation of the extension. Um, and we also are trying to really, uh, in the context of this outbreak, to uh, outreach to uh, researchers who are, we understand are really, really busy. And we made a call to action for uh, outbreak scientists to uh, rapidly review three coronavirus preprints uh, on the website or from their uh, extensions. And we're also trying to organize public discussions on Zoom, uh, like this one, and we have done this before with different with preprints related to other topics, but um, in this particular case, we are speeding up this process and partnering up with JMIR publications and Flawless Plus, and hopefully other uh, journals coming up to organize virtual journal clubs uh, that are hosted uh, by us as facilitators and, we, and paired with experts that can guide the discussions around an emerging preprint on coronavirus um, topic. And so if you click on that, this form under JMR publications, we're currently asking um, crowdsourcing what preprints should be discussed. So please, if you're interested, um, just pitch in. And then on April 14th, we'll have the discussion in which anyone can join. And also anyone can request our support for this discussion. So there is also another form and we invite everybody to do that and it's free and we are happy to uh, help with all the uh, logistics. So I want to thank the members of the advisory committee for pre-review, uh, Sam Hindle, Monica Granados, uh, especially for the leadership team, Naomi Pamphil and Lenny Taylorman, uh, as well as all the contributors for this project. So obviously Michael Johansson from Outbreak Science, um, Georgia, Georgia Bullen for her help with all the user research and interviews, and Sebastian Balasteros and Eric Weissekan for uh, developing the actual tool. Um, as well as obviously funders from uh, funding from the Wellcome Trust and you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela, and to all the speakers that have spoken so far. And next, I'm going to introduce uh, next I'm going to introduce Catherine, who will lead our roundtable discussion with some questions. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your talks. Um, we will kick off this portion of the Q&A to kind of bring in some other points and some of the attendees with their questions. Uh, just a reminder to the attendees that this session is being recorded. Um, and to make a note in your, uh, if you're asking a question of whether or not you would prefer to ask it yourself or if you'd like us to, to posit the question to the speakers. Um, I, I think, you know, I've been following some of the Q&A that's been going on in the, in the comments so far, and it seems like a lot of the questions uh, really kind of revolve around weighing the need for collaboration, openness, transparency, and speed at this time with the potential danger of publishing something that's inaccurate or harmful. Um, and so, you know, I think um, I was wondering if, if more of you wanted to weigh in on that. And, and maybe talk more about what the proper balance there is uh, and ways that, that you've, and precautions you've taken to kind of balance that as much as possible. I know some of you have spoken about it too. Richard? 
So, yeah, I mean, I think it's important thing. I mean, I think it's important thing to think hard about, as I kind of mentioned in the talk, you know, thinking there are more eyes on preprints, but I think it's also something that one has to put in perspective. Um, you know, this is, this is an issue sort of that we have with the web, right? So this exists anyway. I mean, I sort of joked in the past that I don't think that the harm that um, something like MedArchive could do is anything compared to the bombardment of misinformation on the web as a whole, direct to consumer advertisements that I see whenever I watch a sports game, this kind of, so, you know, I think one has to think about there is this big background. And so there's a much bigger picture here about misinformation. And so I think, you know, sort of being transparent about what things are and what they aren't is, is, is absolutely critical. Um, you, you know, I mean, so the, the chloroquine paper, for example, people, you know, people said, oh, you know, should that chloroquine paper have been on Med Archive? Well, the, the, the important thing to notice there is, A, the, the, the information was already public anyway, because the, um, the author had put it on their institutional website. Um, it was then posted on Med Archive, and then very shortly afterwards, it appeared in a peer-reviewed journal. There's some debate going on about the extent to which the peer review actually occurred, but it did appear. So, you know, this goes back to, um, you know, whether the, the notion that, that, that if you close the door to something in your little area, that that will not enable the information to get out anywhere else is, is kind of somewhat naive. So I think what you, what you need to do is think about what's the most responsible process that you can have in your own screening and also what you can put in place to inform people about um, scientific research and, and, you know, the occasional fallibility of it. I mean, it's, it's not just preprints. We've seen a number of, I can think of three or four papers that have appeared about COVID-19 in the peer reviewed literature, be they letters or peer reviewed papers in, um, in medical journals. So this, this kind of, we have to have this conversation and actually, um, so Kathleen Hall Jameson, the author of Cyber War, um, and uh, myself, Verna Kiema from PLOS, and uh, Marsha McNutt, president of National Academy, wrote an article in PNES recently, which I would urge people to look at, that talks about the need to have um, signals around trustworthy information and the importance of um, people understanding that lack of a signal is itself a signal. So I think for preprints, one of the things that, it, that is important is to is to explain that this is preliminary, it's primarily intended for experts, and, and it needs to be discussed and try and have that um, discussion publicly and in a, a transparent way. And I think that's, that, that's the way forward. And actually, I've been pretty encouraged um, with, with the way that most journalists are handling this information. Um, you know, it was interesting with the, with the, with, with the uncanny paper, you know, there was some, it was kind of internet conspiracy theorists who were, who were spreading misinformation, journalists themselves, it was amazing how few of them picked up on that story. The journalists then covered the story about the misinformation, but, you know, so I think it, I've been very encouraged about, you know, I saw Carl Zimmer from the New York Times tweeting a paper on MedArchive the other day, and underneath his tweet, he put in brackets, he put, with the caveat, this hasn't been peer reviewed yet. So I think, you know, I mean, I think transparency is, is, is important here. And we just have to understand that there is, there's always a, you know, you can do things fast and you, or you can do them thoroughly. And, and you, there are pros and cons, but for the most part, in the midst of a pandemic, I think most people are pretty clear that the, the pros of disseminating information in this way far, far outweigh the cons. So, so I'll weigh in this, Dave. Um, at first, I'm a big fan of BioArchive and MedArchive, but I have to say that I find a little bit of that uh, framing a, a, a tad disingenuous, if I'm being honest, because there's a lot of attention seeking that you use in the metrics that are at the bottom of each paper. I mean, so it's hard to say that, you know, it's really for a technical audience, first and foremost, when you have media mentions and blog posts and things like that as part of the way that each paper is presented to the audience. And so I guess I would question, is that really um, the, the right framing for how a paper should be, you know, that's in bioarchive should be uh, credited for getting its attention. Sorry. So, well, so I think there's a couple of things there. So, what I should say, one of the things I should I should point out is that it's we do um, we do put the metrics there. Those are, uh, metrics are generated by 
um, third parties, the, the, the attention metrics. They're primarily, primarily, you know, in part for the benefit of authors because authors like to have and are encouraged increasingly by their employers to, to provide um, metrics of beyond just the impact factor of their paper. So, I mean, we can have a big discussion about whether all metrics are a good or a bad thing in general. Um, but I think, um, so one of the things that we, we do is we have never ranked papers like that. One of the decisions, you, if you go to bioarchive, there is no, we don't have a kind of, this is the most read paper. We don't rank in any way. Those, those, those metrics are primarily for authors to, to use as, um, uh, as evidence of their productivity and attention on their work. I mean, I'm not convinced that that many people really pay too much attention to them. The, the, I mean, what, where they are valuable is that we seek to aggregate all conversations around this work. So that's why we aggregate the tweets and they, the, the links to blogs, et cetera, is so that you can go to a paper and you know, you, you, it's not being peer reviewed, but if you can see that somebody on Out, Outbreak Science has written something about it, there's three blog posts by virologists about it, this is, it's being covered in this news, that you, you have a way to see the conversation happen, happening around it. So our motivation for those, those metrics is not, is not to kind of, um, uh, to, to, to trumpet anything. I mean, if, if, if it were, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't a, we would, a, we wouldn't put them um, on one paper, we create additional pages and we'd, we'd be tweeting the hell out of them and things like that. And we wouldn't bury them in a tab where they're actually quite, quite hard to, to find. Um, so, yeah, so I, 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 I don't think I would, I, I don't think I would, I, I would agree with that, frankly. I, it, it's difficult. And as I say, there's a debate about alt metrics, you know, but, but some authors love the fact that they can get um, evidence that um, their paper is being downloaded and being looked at. You know, people, people, you know, there's a reason why everybody's obsessed with their H index um, and all these things. So I think the idea that we can get away from these types of numbers is, is very difficult, particularly when we're in the midst of a conversation about the fact that current um, uh, examinations of output are based on a single number, the impact factor or citations, and, 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 and people think that's a, a bad thing and we need to have um, uh, much more multi dimensional measures of impact. And if you want to have those things, you can't have them and not have them for the reasons that you're saying at the time. But, you know, I mean, that, but because of the things that you mentioned is why it's one reason why we don't make a big deal about them. They're not highly privileged on the site, on the site in terms of viewability. I'm, I'm a bit struck at how quickly this conversation veered into things that are just foundationally flawed within the scholarly communications landscape anyway, even if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this earlier, actually, when you were speaking, Richard, and you showed the slide um, that said, you know, what should peer review look like in a pandemic? And you had 2020 crossed out. Um, and so, and, you know, this is again, a question for everybody, but, you know, what are, what are really the differences between, in your opinion, between what uh, peer review should look like in a pandemic versus in 2020 or into the future? Like, what are those things that we can change that maybe um, we're realizing for the first time or realizing more clearly now that we're in this crisis, but that really are indicative of much larger uh, problems that are there all along? Um, well, let me just say one thing here, and, and probably Danielle is, one of the, is the person really to talk about this, but I think one of the things that is interesting in, um, in the in the context of a pandemic is this big question about what happens to papers after they're a preprint. So, you know, the numbers for archive and bioarchive are pretty consistent that um, if you look after a couple of years, you get 70% of papers end up formally published in journals. So all the same, most of the same things that are in preprints ultimately become journal articles. That 70% number is probably a little bit low because you get false negatives because it, you because titles and author lists change and some papers can take five years to end up in a journal. So let's say it's closer to 80%. That means that 20% of papers aren't ending up in, in journals. Now, what I'm kind of interested in is in the midst of something like a pandemic, what does that percentage look like? If it takes eight months typically to end up in a journal and you're writing um, a paper about the state of an epidemic in Wuhan 
on January the 30th. Is there any meaning to having that paper formally published on December 1st of 2020 in, you know, Journal of Epidemiological, whatever? So I think that, that, that one of the things that's kind of interesting is it forces us to have that conversation. So there's definitely going to be a cat. I mean, we've always known that there's a small number of papers. There's a category of papers for which traditional peer, peer review doesn't make sense. And as a consequence of a pandemic, you know, it shines a light on the fact that there may be a number of papers for which the traditional peer review doesn't make sense. And I would argue that something like um, the um, approach that Daniela is talking about, which is much more real time, much more about trying to do this kind of continually and quickly um, makes sense. And so it, what, what, did that, what does that kind of 70% figure look like um, in the context of a pandemic? And what does it mean for us thinking about what um, uh, peer review should look like in future? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I would also pitch in and say that uh, it's it's really that what you presented in the last slides, also that the questions of like who is doing it, when we are doing it, and what, it's really like the things that have uh, motivated us a pre-review before even we started with this, uh, that, like thinking about more of like the context of an outbreak and how peer review works and uh, and changing uh, the reason why we really try to engage uh, all researchers into these conversations with the idea that, you know, obviously you'll have to try to have mechanisms to uh, build trust and uh, and kind of like moderate some a little bit of that conversations. But what we would love to see is that both a pre-review and then with this more rapid layer of reviewing in the context of outbreaks is that those comments and those reviews uh, can then speed up the pre-review process itself. Uh, and uh, and so there are a several there are a few journals <laughs> um, that have uh, that are right now trying that that model in which they they do use uh, cr uh, comments from uh, uh, trusted uh, platforms uh, to um, speed up their own process. And I have to say that I have seen a lot of uh, uh, quicker kind of peer review process is happening right now in the context of the pandemic. There is no, definitely there is no comparison with, that, with, 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 with how quickly someone can post a preprint. But I think that there is a workflow and there is uh, that I can, I can see. And as a, um, as a kind of a kind of side, side um, and as an addition to this process, I can also see uh, the, the advantage of having multiple voices and multiple eyes on the same manuscript rather than having two or three reviewers that are selected in a much slower time frame, obviously, by, by a journal. And so what we are also trying to do with the virtual discussions is that we can um, hopefully, uh, the, the goal is to bring together those discussions and, and create a review that can be then um, used by the publication system itself to uh, speed up the pre-review process. So I, we definitely, you know, a pre-review would love to see more uh, more participations uh, by more a uh, more diverse uh, group of peer reviewers, and I think in the context of the pandemics, what we are trying to reason through is like how busy are these researchers themselves, and how can we make this process so that they don't have to spend a week writing a report. Um, and the last thing I want to say is also this idea that by having multiple people commenting and and and, and giving. Uh, expert feedback on a preprint, we can also break down what peer review means. We don't need to write an entire report. It could be that a person who doesn't work in outbreaks but has experience modeling can comment on just a certain section. And so then when we puzzle this together, we have a very robust uh, kind of um, crowdsourced scientific uh, feedback on it. Thanks. Uh, sure, Richard. So I just wanted actually to follow up on something that Daniela said, because um, that, I mean, I think she makes a, a very important point about the diversity of representation um, in, the, in, the, in the review of Paul. We similar, in, in scientific publishing, we simultaneously have these scenarios where one, everybody complains about reviewer burden um, and the fact that um, you know everybody's got reviewer exhaustion, and it's harder and harder to get um, uh, papers reviewed. But simultaneously, we have data coming out saying saying that the um, massive under underutilization of um, vast swathes of the potential peer review population, like the global south, is hugely um, underrepresented. Most peer reviewers come from North America and uh, Western Europe. 
Um, so we're simultaneously complaining that we haven't got enough reviewers while ignoring this big population of potential reviewers. Um, we really don't utilize uh, postdocs um, anywhere near as much as we could. You know, I'm not necessarily going to say that we should, but you know, that, that, is, a, that is a population of experts who, who are largely not called upon. Um, and one of the things that I had had a discussion with somebody recently in the context of the COVID-19 epidemic is that lot, there's lots and lots of labs that have had to shut down. I'm sure that the PIs are still trying to do everything they can and probably have less time on their hands to do the peer review. But there's going to be a lot of, a lot of postdocs who don't have, um, you know, who, who would have been spending X hours per day in a lab and now aren't. And so there's a kind of there's a huge potentially unutilized brain trust there for um, for, for for peer review with, amidst the pandemic, and maybe that could potentially give us some lessons for moving forward beyond the pandemic. Yeah, thank you for that note. Um, I also just want to interject here briefly just to thank Richard Wilder for joining. I'm uh, I'm told that he has to drop off at one o'clock, so. I uh, just wanted to pause briefly and say thank you, and uh, we appreciate the contribution. Unmuted. I actually want to pull in Joe from Africa Archive, who posed an interesting question in the Q&A. I will unmute you, Joe. I'll allow you to talk. Um, do you want to pose your question to the, to the panelists and the attendees? Uh, sure. Thanks for. Can you hear me? Thanks yes. for having me. Um, so I'm Joe, co-founder of Africa Archive, a preprint repository, which was also in the slides by Daniela um, for the African scholarly community. Um, so region specific, and um, my concern was, and also what we put together in the preprint that I shared in the discussion on the Q and A. Um, is that African scholarly research output is hidden and basically invisible on the on the Western landscape, so to say, on search engines like Scopus and uh, the ones we're used to search and scrape for um, information. So, um, but I think um, with the platforms uh, like pre-review and other digital tools. We now have a chance to really make this um, like a global effort and also cross language barriers. So I'd like to ask the panelists or if if you've seen um, kind of initiatives to yeah to address this, particularly in the global south. So not only scraping the the bulk of literature that's available on Ebola and Zika and other epidemics that keep um, crippling the continent or, or rushing over the continent with the, like the rest of the world ignoring um, ever and ever again. But now this is a global effort. So we, I mean, Africa has a lot of lessons learned to share and they're ready to share it if we kind of like we as Westerners kind of are ready to listen. Um, yeah, sorry. I think this is, a, I'm a bit emotional about this because of, like all of us, I've been also working myself in the past three weeks nonstop. And, and yeah, again, I can only please um, have a look at this preprint that we shared and I'd, I'd like to collaborate on all possible levels. If, yeah, if anybody wants to jump into the discussion. Did I make myself clear? I'm not sure. Yeah, hi, Joe. Hi, <laughs> uh, th thank you for, uh, for that, um, for that uh, question. Yeah, so we, um, I think that this is this is definitely like a, a really important point and the fact that uh, we and kind of something that we at Preview we've kind of tried to to put really centered in our mission to trying to engage uh, underrepresented communities in scholarship in the context of, uh, of peer review uh, of preference and uh, I. I, I think that you're completely right. You know, we, we don't have, um, what we can control from our side is that we have uh, several um, things in place that we're trying to organize um, in, the, um, in person, but at this point it will be a lot of virtual events to, um, uh, to highlight the contributions of, um, uh, of communities of scientists that are under-resourced and underrepresented. So partnering with Africa Archive, I owe you an email, I know that. <laughs> Uh, is uh, is something that we have in the pipeline. We have some funding specifically for that. So I hear uh, your call, and I think that we we really need to, um, especially 
in not just like in the context of an outbreak, but like there is so much to learn from um, the research that happens in not just in, in the Europe and the US and especially and, and when it comes to peer review, just changing and shifting this uh, needle to where who are the gatekeepers of scholarly uh, evaluation and publication is um, it is really important. And if we don't change that, there is really no uh, for us, there is really no point in in uh, moving towards uh, the open. And so there is a whole like discussion of what open transparency means, without actually having a true uh, addressing the, ad the accessibility prob uh, problem and who is at the table to participate. So I don't have really have an answer to you, but um, we at all I can say is that at pre review we're really trying uh, hard to make that a center of our mission. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to collaborating. But this question also goes to Richard with MetArchive and, and BioArchive and all the data that you have, which is also um, to some to quite a decent extent um, contributed by African scholars. And I'm like I'm I'm the last person to discourage people, or the opposite. Like I always encourage people share your research up wherever it is seem feasible for yourself. Um, be it Africa Archive, BioArchive, MetArchive, whichever archive, the important thing is to make it accessible. And it's, I think it's for us platform providers to ensure that um, the research output is discoverable across platforms. And I think we already have some tweaks and solutions around this of making our services interoperable. And yeah, the question, I, I wrote you guys an email <laughs> as, um, in the course of the webinar um, to your other co-founder, um, John. So, so please let's be in touch. That's that's. Uh, I don't have a specific question other than the ones that I post. But yeah, I think it's important for the stakeholders to come together to provide all all the possible services to the community to make the endeavor of bringing the literature to the light um, that's currently hidden and and like in a bulk of of yeah just the sheer number of research output being provided and we need to make sense of it and and in an inclusive way and also across language barriers so i i'd also like us to um focus not so much on english only but of course primarily but also look into other language systems and and across the continent because it's a global epidemic so we have to also um cater for other languages Thanks. I think what's what's encouraging here in terms of the discovery is is the um, emergence of the third third party um, discovery and, and indexing tools. So I mean I think that's that's you know I mean I've, we 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 um, historically on the biomedical ser, um, side of things you know there's been PubMed which is a, a very you know a very traditional has a very kind of like um, a traditional way of doing things and aggregating content. Um, but, you know, the emergence of things like Meta, um, so many people using Google Scholar, um, and there's a whole bunch of new, I mean, I was just talking to um, a group yesterday from SiteNet, that seems to be like a whole bunch of new literature discovery tools, which, um, you know, will have flexible ways of deciding what they do and don't index. I mean, I, I know Center for Open Science um, in, indexes all the stuff on the Center of Open Science hosted um, archives as well as bioarchive and med archive. So I think that, I mean I'm encouraged there. I mean I I think we've um, there's there's been sort of one single route for, for for most people for a long term in discovery through PubMed. But actually um, you know in, in a lot of fields people use Google Scholar more. And I I, I really predict that there's going to be um, as people get better and better at, at, at using AI um, and other tools to to give you kind of push alerts to the kind of content that you're interested in, then those third party services will be able to make um, decisions about what they index. Google, the, 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 the universe that is indexed by Google Scholar is somewhat different from the universe that is indexed by Semantic Scholar. That's somewhat different from the universe um, indexed by uh, Microsoft Ac Academic. And I think we'll see more things like this. And with the kind of the deluge of information, people will, there'll be some kind of competition for, um, these services to give you good good alerts, and so, you know, they they will they will they will want to 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 index things like Africa Archive as well as BioArchive and as well as traditional journals. So I'm I'm hopeful that that's a, a good way of um, surfacing some of this information on the language issue. That's a challenge. I mean, Daniela and I have had conversations about this very very recently. I mean, you probably will have seen the um, Panlingua initiative from Humberto and. Um, uh, Rich Abdul, which is, is, is basically using Google Translate 
to, 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 to translate sites. So you can apply that to bioarchival, medarchival, or any other site. Um, I think the, the concern I have, and, and Daniela knows this because we were in, we're in a meeting talking about it, is that the, in some ways you, you, you worry with automatic translation services because they depend on, uh, they, their, their, their translation efficiency is based on kind of like the popularity and the number of documents in that language. So the worry is, is that, the, that you end up um, only translating into languages where people already speak quite good English and the underrepresented groups, um, uh, uh, you know, that there, there, there aren't good translation services because there aren't um, uh, uh, enough um, uh, training sets for those languages. So I think it is, it is a challenge. I mean, but it's, it's a challenge, challenge that can be tackled. Yeah. Sorry. It's, I mean, it's a challenge the scientific community faces as a, as a whole, you know, English having become the lingua uh, franca, but it, yeah, it, it, it is a challenge. I'm not, I'm just, I don't, it's difficult to know how to solve it for the people who need it most, which is the, the languages that um, have the least attention on them right well, now. I think the solution is already there and we also described that or addressed that in the preprint uh, shared. Um, um, so basically, it must be a mix of manual labor, like manual translations mixed with artificial intelligence and better than the one provided by Google Translate because there's better translational services out there, but and we need to liberate also those to make the research accessible and translatable. But of course, we also need a proof check, but the proof, the, the checkpoint for, for quality assurance as on translations is needed also for peer review. There's misconceivings within English, like because we're dealing with non-native speakers in the scientific community with the lingua franca. So, um, so yeah, what would you say the concerns um, it's, it's an extra challenge, but it's, it's one that can be addressed and that needs to be addressed, that's what I'm saying. But yeah, let's please keep talking about these things because we have solutions at our fingertips and just need to um, utilize them. Thank you, Joe. Um, I also want to bring in Sar Sarvana. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, you had a few questions about the um, use of preprints by funders and the long-term effects of um, the increased use and kind of cultural shift toward preprints during this time. Would you like to come in and and ask your question to the panel? Hi. Hello. Um. Hi. Yes. Um. Sorry, my questions are long. I have to see what I will actually mm -hmm. um. Yes, yeah, so um, I had three questions and basically I was hoping that funders would pay more attention to this um, outbreak and how preprints are used and um, wondering whether uh, funders have reached out to the preprint servers and uh, are there conversations between major funders um, and servers on the future and you know, financial sustainability of the, of the servers. My second question was um, on other research, of course, MedArchive um, came recently, uh, and I think it had a few hundred preprints before uh, the pandemic, but I'm wondering if um, other vital research in cancer and diabetes and cardiovascular would, you know, are maybe preprinting faster too. And, um, Right, the last one was that, of course, we uh, see this wonderful trend of academic research labs um, trying to bring the research, the, the, the basic research to applications, such as diagnostics or therapeutics. And I'm wondering if pharmaceutical research um, would, if you anticipate them to start uh, picking up the trend and become more competitive by potentially preprinting because there's a massive money spent um, behind closed doors in those companies. And uh, they usually publish late, and I don't think they usually preprint. So, um, thank you. If I can remember those questions, like, let me take them on. So funders, yeah, I mean, I think with funders, I, I, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, you know, in terms of appreciating print, preprints, you've had statements from, for example, the Wellcome Trust um, mandating that um, 
uh, science in the course of the outbreak should be posted on um, preprint servers. Um, of course, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, have a similar mandate for their investigators um, and the Michael J. Fox Initiative as well are mandating preprints. I mean, obviously we would, um, I would love it if all funders would, would do this. Um, uh, Michael Eisen, John Ingalls and I wrote a paper in PLOS Biology about this, which we called Plan U, suggesting that all funders should do this to um, achieve immediate, immediate free open access to, to research. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, in terms of funding, uh, BioArchive is funded by um, the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, for which we're eternally grateful and they're, they're great partners. So, you know, I only have good things to say about funders at, at this point. Um, you also mentioned other areas. I think in clinical medicine, you mentioned cardiology, some of those areas. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a new experience for clinical researchers in the way that um, it was for biology researchers when we launched this in, um, bioarchive in 2013. I think what, what will be interesting to see is whether the awareness of preprints as a consequence of COVID-19 means that you get an earlier adoption than you would otherwise have had. I mean, but in, in physics, computational science, and the areas of bioarchive and bioarchive, you, you see these waves of adoption in different communities. And so it will be interesting whether some of those waves in um, infectious disease, for example, um, and epidemiology start coming higher and faster because there's greater awareness of um, preprints. Um, and then your final question about pharma. Um, so there is a group called Open Pharma that are trying to push um, dissemination of preprints in, in the pharma world. Um, I think there, there is some enthusiasm for, for some things. Um, but on the other hand, you know, commercial companies have secrets. And so, you know, the, getting them to divide those secrets earlier than they, or, or at all, is, is a different thing. But I think there's definitely, I mean, I've definitely heard enthusiasm for pharma among pharma representatives for early, for, for dissemination of research as preprints that they would normally disseminate as research articles. I think that that, that makes sense. There are, so there are some legal um, concerns that, um, they have about claims that they can make, but there's enthusiasm there. But the, the fact whether they will start divulging stuff that they never normally divulge, I think is a, is a, is a different question. Thank you. Anyone else like to jump into that question? Super quick, just for the funder. Um, so I also want to uh, answer to, like, another question is tangential. So the, the, um, our tool is, is being funded by uh, uh, the Open Research Fund that Wellcome Trust. We don't uh, currently have funding to continue. So this is more of a pitch to funders if they're here. Uh, but um, I think it is important to uh, also like look at what are, what are the things uh, that we should, you know, that the funders should put attention to, uh, to and definitely like prevent servers and, and um, other initiatives should be, um, uh, relevant obviously in this context uh, for um, yeah I guess like I'll just stop here because um, we don't have much time but thanks for that question I have a question uh, actually maybe Dave you'd be best uh, positioned to answer this but I'm wondering um, you know about other research or communication tools that researchers are using aside from preprints, um, even before you get to the point of publication, are there uh, ways that people are communicating that um, have come into play more so in, in these times of the pandemic or um, you know, even the decision-making process around what modalities are more appropriate um, based on the types of things that you're, you're working on or communicating about? Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of this actually. So, um, you know, even before the pandemic, I would typically be on go-to meetings or Zoom calls three to four hours a day with people from around the world. Part of that was because I was living in Australia last year uh, and initially had to have a lot of calls off time zone for, with people who were back in North, North America. Um, and so that's probably ramped up now to five to six hours a day. It's, it's really been helped as some of the video conferencing and uh, screen sharing tools have gotten better so that you can share something on your screen with an audience of people. Um, and that's become a, a very quick way of having conversations that often end up getting enhanced with screen sharing.
Thank you. Anyone else have experiences with communication tools? Yeah, so the, the virtual journal clubs that we have uh, run before um, where we're all uh, conducted on Zoom. And I have to say that our team has learned a lot uh, from the Mozilla, from working with Mozilla groups uh, on that. And that we are currently developing a peer review mentoring program that is, is entirely based on a one-to-one -one pairing with uh, experts and early career researchers. And it's all uh, designed to be virtual and cohort based. So. Uh, for us, we're really grateful that these tools exist um, and uh, we are seeing, we are very also grateful that a lot more people now are using them so that we can have more participations in our virtual journal clubs and hopefully the uh, mentorship program as well, the peer review mentorship program. What is your kind of take on how these tools and the ways that research uh, so far has been communicated has has really shaped the public's understanding of what's going on and the conversation discourse around it like if not for preprints and and some of these other um, ways of communicating you guys have mentioned like how would this be different how would this look different um, and 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 how is this really kind of shaped the conversation around what's happening Open question. Well, I guess I can I can try to venture an answer, and and that is that, you know, I, I think it it. I think the public discourse is maybe not as relevant here as the you know more technical um, people who are working within a particular field. Um, you know, I've often believed that. Um, you know, scientists think their data is more important than it really is. And it makes sense. You know, you think about it all the time. It's your thing. Um, but the reality is you can post your data online. And while there's going to be some number of people who are going to be voyeurs and who are going to look at it and are going to be, you know, um, you know, genuinely curious versus, oh, I heard this is out there. I'm going to click on the link and check it out. It's really a small number of people who are probably going to be able to benefit from it in a meaningful way and use it in their own research. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that we have a very important role in outreach as scientists, um, you know, and as educators, uh, but I would sort of divorce that role from the role in, in putting stuff out in preprints and, you know, and, 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 you know, in, and in uh, our open data sharing. I, you know, it's sort of, um, it's fine that people are looking at it, but really that's not the intended audience. The intended audience are the people who are going to be able to actually use it in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I put on a very different hat and I communicate very differently when I'm doing uh, outreach for education uh, to OA audience because I think that um, you end up with these problematic scenarios where you try to conflate the two, um, you know, as, as evidenced by the chloroquine uh, and the HIV origins of, um, of coronavirus. Um, you know, it's a lot easier for something that's inflammatory and provocative to get attention, even if it's poorly understood. Another example would be aerosol versus droplet transmission or fomite transmission of, of the virus. Uh, and I actually, you know, view that as the the uh, more almost more of a risk than a benefit at the moment. Um, the the real benefit to me is that you know I can learn what other people are doing faster and can incorporate that into my thinking, and other people can learn from us faster and incorporate it into their thinking. Um, and that is an issue. I mean, I, you know, to be very blunt about it, you know, I spent a lot of time telling people why some of the stuff that they have misappropriated or understood out of context from some of the preprints uh, don't fully capture the, the, the what's known about a particular topic. And that's not, um, as Richard said, you know, a feature unique to preprints. The same is true if something showed up in, in a peer reviewed journal. Um, and while I'm, you know, against paywalls, um, the fact is there's long, you know, people have tended to generally ignore things that show up in the Journal of Virology, whether they're in PubMed Central or not. People are not ignoring things as much when they're showing up in MedArchive and BioArchive and they're getting tweeted around the world really quickly. Um, for better or for worse, that's just where we are. Yeah, I, I I think I would I would I would I would agree, I would agree with um, the, what Dave says there. I think you, you know I mean 
it's getting back to this point about the, 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 the bigger picture journalism and things like that. I mean, most, there's, there's a joke that I heard Patty Brennan once tell at a, a, a conference where she said, um, data are like pic pictures of um, people's kids. The, the, the parents think that they're really important and everybody wants to look at them, but it's not clear that everybody else really does. Um, and the, the audience for the intended audience for these things is, is, is pretty small most of the time. Um, and so when we think about scientific misinformation and the way to convey credible information, we should be thinking about the people who are um, aggregating, condensing and conveying things like journalists, like public information campaigns. I mean, I, I had a discussion once with, with somebody a, a few months ago where I was quite blunt, where somebody said, oh, it would be really good if there was a lay summary of every preprint on bioarchive. And my response was, I, I really can't think of anything that would be more of a waste of time. You know, it would take a huge amount of time and effort to get somebody who, uh, who would have to be a good quasi-professional writer to do something like that for 70,000 preprints. What you want is you want good, good journalists like Carl Zimmer, who I mentioned earlier, Ed Yong and people like that, who reach out to scientists, consult them about the bigger picture as Dave mentions to, to synthesize this for public understanding. And what we need to be clear about um, is that you know, there is this spectrum of information from highly technical information all the way through to the article in the New, New York Times by Carl and explaining to people what these things are. So explain this is a preprint and that it hasn't been peer reviewed. Explain that this is in the Journal of virology, but it's been explained by it's been peer reviewed by three people two years ago before it was published and may still be wrong, but probably won't be. And how different that is from, you know, a, a, a news and views that came out in, in Nature or an article in Scientific American or an article in the New York Times. And, and being, being transparent about all these things and educating people about the, the missions of these different things, I think, is the, is the way forward. All right, uh, if there are no further comments on this issue, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, everyone who has participated in this webinar, um, especially our panelists, Dave, uh, Richard, and Daniela, as well as all of you uh, attendees for weighing in um, with your questions and comments. Um, this has been a really uh, rich and interesting discussion. Uh, we will be uh, saving a recording of this webinar and uh, will aim to post it online. Uh, so please do look out for that. Uh, please also follow ASAP Bio and KFG on, on Twitter or your pro, uh, chosen uh, notification modality. Um, and uh, uh, we look forward to communicating with you in the future. Thank you all again so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.